I found out recently that one of the better historical dramas is getting a second season. It turns out that I read a book fairly recently on the subject, so I wanted to make a video on why this show could have the potential to be really good, if done right. What's the objective with this video? First, is to lay out some of the problems the show is going to run into. I also want to cover a lot of the history and get to explaining some of the important events that would happen if the show follows history. Then, I'll give you a conclusion. Starting with why future... Really? Now? Seriously? Sorry to interrupt this video, but we have some news. The trailer for the second season has come out right before I was going to record this video. This has caused me to now have to address this trailer. So quickly, I'll just say I have no idea what the events the show is working off of. I have done a fair amount of research for this video and I can't make heads or tails of what's going on. There is the potential that the IMDb page does not have all the characters that will be in the show listed. Either way, Tiberius, who should be the Roman commander to arrive next, is not on the character list, so... Yeah. Germanicus is also nowhere to be found on this list either. It also looks like one of the Roman characters will be Arminius's brother. At one point in Tacitus's history, he writes, Arminius and his brother Flavius talked to each other before the Battle of the Vesser River. Flavius stayed on the Roman side and the two argued. And by the way, the IMDb page does have a character named Flavius, so I would say this is probably a hundred percenter. Let me just say, the trailer was very uninspiring. I'll be honest, I'm not really sure where this leaves this video. Um, I was planning on waiting to see what the trailer was before doing this, but it took so long to come out, or for the trailer to come out, that I just wrote this basically this entire script by the time it came out. So you're just stuck with this strange add-on to this video. Just so everyone knows, I speak pretty positively about the first season despite its problems, in case you thought I hated it or something. Alright, I guess uh, now back to the rest of this video. Starting with why future seasons of this show could be really good. One of the more interesting Romans of his time should enter the story very soon, Germanicus, the Roman commander who will be the great rival of Arminius. This is where the story needs to put all its focus, the fight between these two. I'm not sure this show is set to currently handle this. My reasoning is, the show has the Romans being the bad guys. The show has shown them to be incompetent as well. This works, but for this rivalry to work, Germanicus will need some compelling character motivation. We don't need to think Germanicus is a good man, but we do need to understand why he's doing what he's doing. As well, Germanicus is a skilled leader and general. With the way history goes, just making Germanicus a cartoon villain is not going to work. I'm going to make a section in this video about Germanicus and who he is. This is a historical drama, and this is based on real events. We should know a few things about the events. I would give a spoiler warning, but that feels strange because you could have just learned this from reading one of the most famous Roman writers, Tacitus, writing almost 2,000 years ago. One thing that could be a problem for this show is how do you introduce what will be the second, or potentially the most important character in the middle of the show. I'll be honest, I don't know of any way to make this happen successfully 100% of the time. For this show to work into the future, Germanicus has to be introduced and for his character to be written well. As well, some characters we have in the story right now are made up or get early exits if the history is followed. One example I can give is we know Thisnelda, one of the main characters in this show, ends up getting captured. During Germanicus' final campaigning season that has three important battles, Thusnelda won't be present. The reason I mention this is if she is still the second most important character, this will probably make things in the show awkward. Even though she is an interesting character, this is often what makes dramatizing history difficult, is in real life unexpected things happen, taking away from what could be a more interesting path. This is why alternative history is fairly popular. Now I want to move on to the timeline of events. I'll start with the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, and, you know, that's what the first season builds up to and shows, and from there, I'll move on. As well, I'll be using AD, not CE. Most modern history books will use CE, but I notice places like Wikipedia and other popular places to get information quickly use AD, so if you're not familiar, BCE is BC, and CE is AD. My guess is many people may not know the Georgian calendar that we use has these two different ways of referencing dates. So, in 9 AD, potentially, in September, the Battle of Teutoburg Forest happened, and this is the battle at the end of the first season of the show. 
For several years after, we don't really have much information, but in 13 AD, Germanicus is made governor of the bordering provinces to these Germanic tribes that Arminius is leading. Next, we get Augustus dying, and Tiberius becomes princeps, or the emperor, and then the Rhine legions revolt, and Germanicus has to negotiate with them, and Germanicus's first campaigning season happens, and this is all in 14 AD. And then we get to 15 AD, Germanicus leads another campaign into Germany and attacks several tribes and recovers the eagle of the 19th legion. Germanicus and his troops bury and build a monument to the Romans lost at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest. The same year, Germanicus frees Segestes and captures the Znelda. Germanicus' fleet then runs into some problems on the Frisian coast. This is in the modern day Netherlands. Then in 16 AD, Germanicus leads an amphibious invasion into Germania and wins three important battles. I'll leave this timeline here. This is really what the show should cover. As well, you see the time between Teutoburg and Germanicus arriving is five years, and then really no action, like big action happens in that time frame. It will be interesting to see where the show starts the second season at, and the show will probably have some time to fill you know, in between the end of the Battle of Teutoburg and Germanicus arriving. This usually concerns me when it comes to historical dramas, because most of the time it's done very poorly. Before I get too far into the video, I want to explain something. Why am I not making a video with a ton of information about Arminius, who is the show's main character? Well, the historical sources are from the Romans, and we get their point of view. So the Romans take center stage in history. A lot of the information we have is of Germanicus and as, you know, Arminius is the enemy. So if you're wondering why this will have such a Roman perspective, this is the reason why. Also, why I'm suggesting Germanicus be an important character in this show, because he's the one we actually have information on. Before I get to my history section, I also want to mention why I'm not giving criticisms about the first season of the show. Mainly that many other people have already done this. Many people have covered things that I really also don't have much knowledge about. Language, for example, I don't know Latin, and you'll see that very soon because I'm going to mispronounce a lot of Roman names. The next being things like armor. I have a little bit of knowledge regarding Roman armor, but many other people have much better knowledge of armor, and I'll leave it to them. What I really want to do is go over the events the show should cover in the future. One thing I should also get out of the way is, if I like history so much, why would I have some praise for historical drama? Most people who like history have a lot of problems with historical dramas. I often do as well. The problem is it's interesting to at least see the armor and an attempt to recreate the atmosphere of some time in the past. History also has some of the most interesting stories as well, and the attempt at telling them is going to be too hard to resist. Even the Romans would replicate past battles in the Colosseum for entertainment. Pleased to bring you the legionnaires of Scipio Africana! People are going to try and tell historical events in not just an academic way. The real question is, what is the best way to do this? To that, the only suggestion I can give is keep to the history. Be very careful of what you decide to add. Barbarians is a real mixed bag. There's a lot that is not accurate, but some of the themes are there. For example, Arminius being a part of the German auxiliary cavalry and betraying Rome did happen. What were the reasons for Arminius turning on Rome is harder to tell. It seems likely Arminius was unhappy with Rome before he ever got to Germany. In the show, Arminius has Varus as his adopted father. This is not the case. With all this information, you might say, why would this be one of the better historical dramas? Barbarians does have a lot of the big events take place, which a lot of shows and movies don't actually do. Also, this show, getting quite a bit of the armor right from what I've heard, and the Latin in the show is pretty good as well. The other thing is the characters are reasonably compelling and the show is entertaining. The point I'm trying to make is there's some give and take here, the thing for me is, there is effort, and so far the show is not completely screwed up. I want to move on to who Germanicus is, but to explain that, I really have to explain Roman history. Like most projects, I start, they expand in size, and I end up creating something different than what I originally wanted to make. This happened here, and I ended up writing a lot of historical information, and I've just decided to leave it all in. I should, if I remember, add in timestamps. So, if you want to get to the other information, feel free to. 
The reason I wrote all of this is to try and help people understand the position not only Germanica starts in, but how the world at the time was. As well, a lot of important Romans are Germanicus's direct ancestors. I did not want to assume people just knew who Antony or that Octavian is Augustus. My hope is by writing all this lead up, people can better understand the later information. The real trouble I had is where to start. As a fan of history, I would start at the founding of Rome, but trying to cover that much would be getting too off track, or at least more than I already planned to. So, instead, I'll start close to Julius Caesar's death. Caesar is the most recent and new-ish of the Roman politicians to find out that having the best army is the ticket to power. Caesar won his civil war and his dictator in Rome. Now, there's a problem, which is Caesar is old, and he really, even if he wanted to, isn't going to be able to hold on to power long enough to really change the Roman system. So, Caesar is going to instead once again do his favorite hobby, conquest. Caesar was planning to go conquer Dacia in modern-day Romania, then go Larpus Alexander and conquer Parthia, which is basically modern-day Iraq and Iran. Before Caesar could go off in his campaigns, he got stabbed 23 times dying in Pompey's theater, Pompey being Caesar's greatest rival. Things now get a bit complicated because Caesar makes Octavian his heir, and this was unprecedented and unexpected. Octavian is Caesar's great-nephew and was only 18 when he was adopted by Caesar after his death. Adoption in Rome of adults was not uncommon, but it happened when both parties were still alive. Caesar did it after he died. That is what was unheard of. We get into the stage of the Caesarians, and I'll call them the anti-Caesarian factions. The anti-Caesarians killed Caesar, but they also had no plan to take over the reins of government and root out the Caesarians from power. This allows Caesarians like Mark Antony and Lepidus to put themselves in a better position to negotiate. In this negotiation, Caesar's body is not thrown in the Tiber, his decrees are not overturned, and his property is not confiscated. When Antony does Caesar's funeral oration, the crowd in Rome completely turns on the anti-Caesarians, and they have to leave the city. The anti-Caesarians leave to the east, where they are in control of many provinces. With this chaos going on, the Caesarian faction was not completely whole. Antony was basically trying to sideline Octavian, splitting Octavian from the rest of the Caesarians. Octavian, having now the power of literally being the son of Caesar and having his name, they call me Caesar now. But... This got him a lot of support and, importantly, legions. The next big events are Octavian and forces fighting for the Senate take on Antony and win driving him north out of Italy. With a massive army of anti-Caesarians forming out east, the Caesarians decide to become friends again. Now, Antony and Octavian and the rest of the Caesarians are fighting together. The Caesarians create a new triumvirate, the Second Triumvirate, with Antony, Octavian, and Lepidus. The Second Triumvirate wins the Battle of Philippi, defeating the anti-Caesarians, where Octavian and Antony are present for the victory. Just a side note, this battle is crazy and absolute chaos and you should go read about it. After some territorial negotiations, what we end up with for some time is Antony has the Roman East, which is Rome's most wealthy territories. For a bit, Antony also controls northern Italy and Gaul as well. Octavian has Hispania and Lepidus is given North Africa. Lepidus is the weakest of the triumvirs. This might be partly Lepidus' own fault though. Octavian and Antony thought he was scheming behind their backs, and while we don't have the sources to confirm this, but it's still interesting information. I thought people should know that Lepidus was not just sitting around doing nothing. Octavian is actually put in a bad position. He is the one who is closest to Rome, and has to be the one to settle all of the veteran troops, giving them land. What Octavian does is take land away from farmers in Italy and give it to the veterans. The expected happened, and a famine hit Rome. In the past, Rome conscripted their farmers to fight their wars. The idea was good farmers make good soldiers. When the Roman army became professional and people other than farmers could now become soldiers, the old idea did not work very well. So now, when the Romans tried to make these soldiers farmers and took away the farmers' farms, it went terribly. This caused Octavian to become unpopular and Antony's brother, Lucius, who was consul at the time, 
got together eight legions and took Rome. Octavian got an army in the south of Italy, and Lucius, who realized he could not hold the city, went north towards Gaul. Lucius met up with generals, loyal to Antony, in the north of Italy, and they asked Lucius if he was acting on his brother's behalf. For some reason, Lucius did not give a straight answer. Now this could be because Antony might have wanted to appear to be not involved, but it's hard to not see that Antony could have handled Octavian now. It really does seem like Antony must have been involved because his wife, Fulvia, was deeply involved, raising legions of her own to help. Now steps in Marcus Agrippa, a friend of Octavian from a young age. When Caesar was fighting in Africa, Agrippa's brother fought against Caesar and got captured. Agrippa asked Octavian to help, and Octavian got Agrippa's brother freed, and this sealed the bond, and Agrippa would be Octavian's greatest ally. I'll explain this now. Agrippa is important because he is the military commander, and Octavian is the politician. Octavian has Agrippa go north to deal with Lucius and Fulvia. Agrippa wins, Lucius and Fulvia are allowed to leave, and things quiet down for a bit. Until one of Antony's generals in Gaul dies, and Octavian takes all the legions in the region. Antony is surprised by this act of aggression and sails east to Italy. When Antony's fleet arrives at a city called Brundisium, the city does not let him in and prepares for battle. Antony does the same. Octavian hears about this and heads down to Brundisium, and after some negotiations and no one wanting to fight, the Treaty of Brundisium happened. This was a rearranging of territory, so Octavian got Gaul and Illyricum, so the Roman West. Octavian still had the rich east and the upper hand. Also, Antony married Octavian's sister because Fulvia died suddenly. To add on top of Octavian causing a famine, Octavian had to deal with the son of his now father Caesar's old rival Pompey. Sextus Pompey was the son of Pompey the Great, Caesar's rival. And yes, get the laughing out of the way, the name is Sextus. Sextus takes over the big islands around mainland Italy, this being Corsica, Sardinia, and Sicily. What made Octavian and Sextus go to war is Octavian's bad policy regarding the farms, and without being able to grow enough food in Italy, food had to be imported. Food would have been imported from Sicily, but Sextus is in control of Sicily, so food had to be imported from elsewhere. Sextus is called the Boat King. Sextus had a strong navy which he used to blockade Italy, putting the squeeze on Octavian, forcing him to act. But nobody wanted to go to war and the domestic unrest facing Octavian, he decided to negotiate. One of the most strange negotiations in history happened. Octavian invited Antony to the negotiation, and it was at a city called Mycenaeum. This all sounds rather normal until you learn that Sextus would not go to shore to negotiate. This is because his father Pompey was killed when he went ashore in Egypt. Sextus had a platform built offshore and had his navy behind him, Octavian and Antony had a platform built closer to shore. The two sides negotiated by yelling at each other from a distance at sea. Somehow this worked and peace was achieved. Sextus was allowed to become governor of the territories he was in control of, plus southern Greece. Octavian also got the blockade removed. With this peace achieved, what did Octavian do? Start building a navy for no particular reason at all. Until in 38 BC, Octavian attacked Sextus by sending this navy he built to go after Sicily. Let's just say this was a disaster, and Octavian got beat bad, losing half its ships. Now weather, which is out of our human hands, had something to do with this failure, but things like bad ship design and not well-trained crew had a part to play as well. Octavian gambled and lost the money he was making again from the blockade being lifted. This money was used for the attack and it failed. Now the blockade was back and the famine returned and the unrest returned as well. Now Octavian called back Agrippa from Gaul where he had been so successful he could have had a triumph but with Octavian failing he did not want to hold one so Octavian could avoid the added humiliation. Agrippa was given command of Octavian's forces to take on Sextus. Agrippa got to work, building a harbor in a lake near the coast and made a canal to the sea so the ships being built in the lake could get out. Agrippa built and trained a new navy, 
and with Octavian getting Lepidus to help, a new campaign could begin. To speed this part up, basically with Octavian and Lepidus pretty much throwing everything and the kitchen sink at Sextus, something had to break. What broke was Lepidus not running into as many problems and landing in Sicily. Octavian and Agrippa had more problems on their end, but eventually defeated Sextus. With Sextus being defeated, Lepidus, who played a large role in the war, tried to take advantage of this. Lepidus was the one in Sicily and gained all the legions of Sextus because Lepidus was the one there to accept their surrender. Lepidus now wanted Sextus's former possessions, and to be honest, he had a point. For Octavian, this would just put him back in the position he started in. Now Lepidus could just cut off food to Rome. Octavian went off to Sicily to do some negotiations. Ah, yes. The negotiator, General Kenobi. We've been waiting for you. But when Octavian arrived at Lepidus's camp, he was told to leave. You were right about one thing, Master. The negotiations were short. And a bunch of conflicting events happen. A attempt on Octavian's life most likely happened. After, he might have given a speech, but what we do know is some of Lepidus' troops left their camp and joined Octavian. When Octavian's army showed up, and when I got to them, we went into aggressive negotiations. Lepidus' army started leaving Lepidus en masse. You call this a diplomatic solution? No, I call it aggressive negotiations. Lepidus, in a play to strengthen himself, lost everything except for his title of Pontifex Maximus, the highest religious title. It comes through the sources that people really did not like Lepidus. I have mostly been talking about Octavian, and now I'm going to be explaining what Antony has been doing. Because I've laid out what Octavian has been doing, I can just layer in the events pertaining to Antony, so the timeline makes sense. What has Antony been up to in the East? Well, Antony's goals basically emulate his mentor, Caesar, and do some conquest of his own. When Caesar conquered Gaul, it made him rich and popular, helping him out. Antony wants to do the same. He wants to attack Parthia. Before Antony can do this, he has to do some administrative tasks first. The Roman East has always been a bit of a mess, and Antony starts to set it up in a more comprehensive way. Because Antony is in charge of the East, he is the closest to the important kingdom of Egypt. One of the most famous figures in all of antiquity is here, Cleopatra. I'll try to explain Egypt fast. Egypt is the last of Alexander's successor states. All the others got taken out by Rome. Egypt ends up basically a Roman client state. Rome ends up deeply involved in their politics. A example being, Cleopatra is in her position because Caesar put her in charge over her brother. Now, I want to say, Cleopatra is one of the most misunderstood figures ever. Cleopatra has the reputation of being a seductress. This is really not the case. We only know of Cleopatra being with two men, that being Caesar and Antony. That's it. Not really fitting the reputation that Cleopatra normally has. Antony, in October of 41 BC, summoned Cleopatra to meet him at Tarsus. This will help explain the relationship between Antony and Cleopatra for some time this being one of Antony using Cleopatra and her trying to use him to achieve each other's goals. Cleopatra shows up in a boat filled with gold, and the boat has purple sails. Just so you know, purple cloth is a status symbol and is ridiculously expensive and shows wealth. This act is to try and show that Cleopatra has some independence. Cleopatra does not want to look like Antony's complete subordinate. This is not the romantic story that is often told. Antony really wants to take Parthia, and to do this, he needs Cleopatra's money, which Antony does get a lot of. This is the point where Fulvia, Antony's wife, and Lucius, Antony's brother, tried to remove Octavian by force and failed. This happened in 40-41 to 41 BC. While his family is fighting, Antony basically went on vacation to Egypt. While Fulvia and Lucius were taking on Octavian, Antony was potentially out of contact, maybe intentionally, but either way it really looks like a mistake on Antony's part. This is also when Antony and Cleopatra started their affair. The next big events are the Parthians invading Syria, which was a Roman province at the time. 
The Parthians get beat unexpectedly in some battles by Publius Ventidius, who celebrates a triumph for these victories. Before the invasion of Parthia, and while Ventidius was leading the armies, Antony met up with Octavian to give support for his campaign against Sextus. Cleopatra enters the story again, and to reinforce my point about this not being a romance, Antony had not seen her in four years. Until she enters the story again. And here we get a sense that Antony might have started to become more desperate. In a meeting with Cleopatra called the Donations of Antioch, Antony acknowledged the twins he had with Cleopatra as his and gave some territory to Egypt. These territories are Phoenicia, Palestine, parts of Crete, Cyrene, and Cyprus. These territories in the past had been controlled by Egypt. As well, these territories contain the resources to create a fleet. Antony is sort of subcontracting the building of a fleet to Cleopatra. Remember, at this point, Octavian's right-hand man Agrippa has built up a fleet. Antony is looking to the future here, potentially seeing a conflict with Octavian. Cleopatra gives Antony money and supplies to invade Parthia. Antony starts his campaign into Parthia. Antony invades from Roman-allied Armenia, bringing his army down into Parthia from the north. A past invasion of Parthia failed when Crassus invaded from Syria, getting caught out in the desert and losing the Battle of Cari. In Plutarch's writings on Crassus, Plutarch says the Armenian king wanted to give aid with his troops, having Crassus invade through Armenia. It would seem that Antony was trying to learn from past mistakes. Now in Parthia, Antony's supplies get raided, but he continues on and tries to take the city of Frata and fails. Just so you know, the city can also be called Paraspa as well. With his supplies gone, Antony has to retreat back through the mountains. The Roman army gets back to Roman territory, but Antony's army is a shell of itself. At this point, you can say for sure the cracks are showing. Antony now looked vulnerable. There is the thought that Antony had to make some changes to become more Hellenistic and Eastern. This was to try and keep any advantage that Antony had. Antony then has his second donations, the donations of Alexandria. These donations set the children of Cleopatra as the kings and queen of various territories. Two of these territories are Armenia and Parthia, which Antony does not control. Also, some of these territories were Roman territories, and these were being given away. This is where the propaganda starts to kick in by Octavian against Antony. First, Antony lost to Parthia, making him look weak. Second, Antony is cooperating more and more with Cleopatra. Let's just say the decadent and incestuous Ptolemies, the ruling dynasty of Egypt that Cleopatra was a part of, were not palatable to the Romans. So it's not hard to see why Octavian was able to drum up support to fight Antony. How did Octavian do this? Well, there are a few things. First is the propaganda. Antony being in the clutches and bewitched by Cleopatra, the foreign queen. And just so you know, the idea of monarchy was taboo in Rome, so a foreign queen is extra taboo. With all this buildup, Octavian got more aggressive in his actions and showed up in the Senate with armed men. The senators in Rome that supported Antony got the idea and left. To try and hammer the point home, when these senators showed up in the east, many speak out against Cleopatra. But at this point, Antony needs Cleopatra and she needs him, so no change was going to happen. At this point, Octavian did something taboo and took Antony's will being kept with the Vestal Virgins and read it in the Senate. Just so everyone knows, it seems to me almost certain that Octavian was using this as propaganda and should not be taken at face value. What was something in the will that would upset the Romans? Well, Antony was to have Cleopatra's son, Caesarion, legitimized. As well, Antony was to be buried in Alexandria with Cleopatra. But what really put things over the edge is when Antony divorced Octavia. She was Octavian's sister who married Antony. This went down horribly. The people in Italy thought Antony had fully gone over to, let's say, the dark side, and had become un-Roman. Now, apparently, Italy and the surrounding provinces like Gaul, Spain, and Africa, and others, swore allegiance to Octavian in a war against Antony. I'll try to describe this war as simply as I can. Antony got his army and fleet trapped near the Greek port city of Actium. Antony, in an attempt to break out or escape, joined battle with Agrippa and lost. This is in 31 BC. From here, it's basically over for Antony and Cleopatra. 
By 30 BC, Alexandria is lost, and Antony and Cleopatra have Romeo and Juliet themselves, and Octavian is victorious. Cleopatra's son with Caesar is killed, and some of Cleopatra's kids with Antony are allowed to live. With Octavian victorious, he ends up reforming Rome. Octavian basically takes the position of dictator without officially being a dictator and making it permanent. What Octavian does is keep the Roman Republican system, but place himself at the top, in a position called princeps, which means first citizen. What Octavian can do is manipulate Roman politics to his wishes, and he controls the whole army. In an interesting move that is obviously planned, Octavian tried to give power back to the Senate, and the Senate said no, giving him a new name, Augustus, which means revered one. This is also when Augustus starts to become princeps, just so you know this was in 27 BC. What everyone should know is Augustus gained his powers over time. Augustus also, with his new position, just took the powers of other positions in the government and just melded them together to make a new office. This is a really creative way to get a bunch of powers without looking like a king, the big Roman taboo. Augustus got all these powers from the Senate, so this makes everything above board. I am the Senate. I should also point out from now on I'll be calling Octavian Augustus. I don't really know a lot about the Praetorian Guard, but Augustus creates it. This ends up being the police force for Rome, controlled by Augustus. Now, this early on, the Praetorian Guard is not the emperor-killing institution it becomes. The Praetorian Guard was genuinely the police force for controlling the city of Rome, which in the past had no police and could get completely out of control. In the past, there were massive political gang wars. This was the reason to make the Praetorian Guard, and also, you know, do Augustus's bidding as well. Now we're going to go back in time a bit and mention that Augustus, back close to the time of the wars with Sextus, married a woman called Livia. She already had two kids, the future Emperor Tiberius and Nero Claudius Drusus, who I'll be calling Drusus from now on, mostly because there's a more famous Nero. So, Drusus is Germanicus's father. Now I want to go over who Germanicus's parents were. Drusus was from the Claudian family who are the most aristocratic and one of the most important families in Rome. Drusus married Antonia Minor. I'll quickly mention that Minor is used because Romans would name people the same name so often. Major or Minor can be used to quickly determine what person is being talked about. Antonia is the daughter of Antony and Octavia. Antony, to seal a alliance, married, well, now Augustus, then Octavian at the time's sister, Octavia. The reason I mention this is Germanicus is related to or married to a descendant of every important person that I have talked about so far, which is part of the reason why I went over all that history in the first place. If I said Antonia is the daughter of Antony and you did not know who that was, it would not, you know, hit the same. Germanicus is born in 15 BC, just so you know. Something that I want to get to, though, is Drusus and Tiberius were sent to campaign in what is now modern-day Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany. The two brothers were very successful. This is when the conquest of the German tribes really begins. But in 9 BC, Drusus fell off his horse or some kind of horse-related accident happened. Drusus was mortally wounded and would die a month after the accident. Tiberius took his brother's body back to Rome, walking the whole way back from Germany. Now, Germanicus did not have a father, but got the consolation prize of a new name. The Senate decided to give Drusus civic honors and gave him the agnomen Germanicus. What is interesting is the Senate allowed Drusus's sons to inherit the name as well. So Germanicus is not the original name of the man I've been calling Germanicus. The reason history calls him Germanicus is, well, he does fight the Germans, but also because his name is Nero Claudius Drusus, after his father. You will see very soon there is another name change. This is also probably why everyone just calls him Germanicus. Also, Germanicus just sounds cool. The reason I explained what the Principate was and how the Roman Republican system was still sort of intact is because this affects Germanicus's life. Germanicus is in Augustus's family, and because Augustus wanted his family members to accumulate more prestige, Augustus had his family members take on important government positions. Because being in charge allowed Augustus to manipulate the system, family members of Augustus would get more important jobs at a younger age. Augustus was fast-tracking people's political careers. This also worked in the opposite direction. Augustus allowed people to speak against him in the Senate, but these people, after some point, would just not get promoted anymore. 
back to Germanicus, he had been well educated and would have spent a lot of time with Augustus, who pushed heavily for his extended family to be educated. To continue to get the events of Germanicus's early life out of the way, Germanicus married Augustus's granddaughter Agrippina the Elder, whose parents were Agrippa, Augustus's best friend and best commander, and Julia the Elder, who was Augustus's daughter. I should point this out. This marriage worked out, and Agrippina is an interesting person in her own right. I'll probably give you some more information on Agrippina a bit later. This is where I'm going to try and explain why Tiberius became emperor, and why Germanicus would become heir to Tiberius. To start with, Augustus had no sons, and had hopes that Gaius Caesar, or Lucius Caesar, sons of Agrippa and Julia, would succeed him. Both of them died young, in their early 20s. But Agrippa had one more son that could inherit, Agrippa Posthumus. It's hard to tell exactly what Agrippa Posthumus's problem was, but it's said he was vulgar and brutal. Augustus had him disinherited and exiled. Augustus adopted Tiberius, and this gets complicated, but Tiberius was married to Julia, Agrippa's widow. This is where things get strange, so Tiberius knew Julia was cheating on him, and this, along with other causes, basically caused him to leave Rome for a time. Why would I guess it was his wife that caused him to leave? When Augustus banished Julia for adultery and partying, Tiberius came back to Rome. I put some of this out of chronological order, just so you know, but I'll try and briefly straighten things out. After Gaius Caesar and Lucius Caesar both died, Agrippa Posthumus and Tiberius were adopted, at or around the same time. Then Agrippa Posthumus was exiled. Tiberius was the last man standing, but did not really inspire a lot of confidence from Augustus. Tiberius had to adopt Germanicus as his son. Now, there's another name change that happens for Germanicus. Nero Claudius Drusus becomes Julius Caesar. Okay, stay with me. Remember, the original Caesar adopted Augustus, making him Caesar, and Augustus adopted Tiberius, also making him Caesar. And now Germanicus is adopted by Tiberius, making him Caesar. So now Germanicus's name is Germanicus Julius Caesar. I guess I should also cover this. Augustus ended up instating a bunch of laws to promote old Roman values. One of these was punishing infidelity. I'll give Augustus some credit here. He did punish his own family for not following these laws as well. Julia, I talked about before, was Augustus' daughter, and she got banished, as an example. It should be pointed out that one of the reasons Germanicus was well-liked by Augustus is because he was well-behaved. Germanicus seemed to be what Augustus was trying to promote with these laws. Let's get to the big events for Germanicus. I'll start with the Illyrian Revolt. Illyria is in modern-day Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, that area. This revolt started because of Roman mismanagement. This revolt was massive. Tiberius was the one sent to command the armies to put down this revolt. Tiberius was a good commander, but he was cautious, waiting for the right conditions to act. This cautious approach was not working, and Augustus thought Tiberius might have been trying to stall, keeping himself in command, but this is probably not true. Augustus, without any other family members he could trust to be put in command of more forces, Augustus picked basically who was left, the inexperienced Germanicus, to lead this army. Germanicus had to recruit and train an army from scratch and bring it to Illyria. Germanicus also had to learn tactics and other necessary skills before arriving in Illyria. When Germanicus got to Illyria, he became a commander under Tiberius. Germanicus takes part in several battles and is successful. Germanicus gets promoted and is given command of an army group. The rebellion is eventually crushed, and an interesting thing to note is Arminius most likely fought for the Romans in this war. In the first season of Barbarians, there is a scene of Arminius talking about how he fought in this war, and it is good added historical information. I'm going to quickly go through some of the events after the Illyrian War finishes. Arminius causes a Roman army to disappear in the forest in 9 AD. Tiberius is sent to fix Varus's mistake and stabilize the situation. This is from 9 AD to 11 AD. Germanicus is elected consul in 12 AD. Germanicus is also made the governor of the several bordering provinces of Germany. Germanicus was governor from 13 AD to 16 AD, the entirety of everything that I'm going to cover. Then, Augustus dies and Tiberius is now princeps. That's in 14 AD. I'll just quickly mention, before we get to some more history, if I had to try and give Germanicus character motivation, what would I do? 
well, I would have him try and live up to his father's accomplishments. Remember, Drusus is Germanicus' father, and the reason Germanicus even has the name Germanicus is because Drusus was successful in Germany. As well, Germanicus is related to and grew up around all the greatest Romans of the time. That's a lot to live up to. As well, basically all aristocratic Romans had ambition and wanting honors built into their DNA. The past defeats by Arminius would not sit well either, and getting revenge would be on Germanicus' mind as well as the rest of the Romans. Also, Arminius had undone a lot of what Germanicus' father had accomplished in the region. This will be the section where I'll start to explain events that really need to be in the show. These events are related to Germanicus in Germany fighting Arminius. Germanicus' first test is dealing with a mutiny from the Rhine legions. First, I should explain that not all the Rhine legions mutinied. The legions in Lower Germania were the ones to mutiny. The legions in Germania Superior were waiting to see how things went down. What we are told is that the mutiny started in the summer and lasted until the fall. Germanicus showed up to the camp of the 1st and 20th legions that were mutinying. When Germanicus arrived at the camp, he realized things were not going to be easy. The legionaries were supposed to form an honor guard and escort Germanicus into the camp, but that did not happen. Germanicus entered the camp and went up to a platform to speak. He asked for the legionaries to get into their military units. The soldiers said they could hear him fine, but eventually did comply. With the legions formed up, Germanicus gave a speech, and with his training and political expertise, this was not unfamiliar territory for him. Germanicus started with talking about past victories and Italian unity but then moved on to why the discipline of the soldiers had gone and what happened to their officers. This went over not as well as talking about past victories. The soldiers started shouting at Germanicus. The soldiers were all shouting about injustices that had been done to them. Some of these were unnecessary beatings by centurions, centurions taking bribes for easier work, officers were handing out corporal punishment for minor offenses, also, because of bad bureaucracy, many veteran legionaries were well past their time of required service. I will point out that several officers were killed by their men when the mutiny happened. Others were put under house arrest. Germanicus listened to the complaints and understood that these men were not rebelling against Rome, but were frustrated with the conditions they were put under. At some point, a man yelled out that Germanicus should replace Tiberius. At this point, Germanicus got off stage and started to walk out. He was stopped by the soldiers, and they told Germanicus to get back on the stage. Germanicus told the soldiers that he would not, and that he would rather die than betray Tiberius. Germanicus drew his sword to try and hammer the point home. Historian Lindsay Powell says, It was precisely the kind of trick an orator would use in the law court, but, with the troops on the front line, the melodrama fell flat. Several soldiers offered their gladiuses to Germanicus. One said that he should use his military-issue gladius because it was sharper. As you can see, the situation was not going very well, and things seemed to be getting dangerous because several officers that were with Germanicus got him to safety. After this, things got worse, and there were rumors that the legions were going to go raid nearby towns. Also, the mutinying legions in Lower Germania were sending messages to the legions in Germania Superior to join them. Also, news of the mutiny was reaching the German tribes, so this situation could get even worse. Germanicus and his officers formulated a plan that accepted some of the mutineers' demands. This was rejected by the mutineers who knew they had the advantage and rejected the offer. At this point, Germanicus realized he had to accept all the demands. These demands were for men who had served the appropriate amount of time to be discharged. The rest of the men were to be given money owed to them. Germanicus went to the other legions in Germania Superior and gave them the same offer. All went well except one legion, the 16th, were hesitant to accept, but eventually did. Then Germanicus gets a secret message from Tiberius. I'll admit I don't really understand this letter, but it seems to be Tiberius saying he would only tell Germanicus what information he needed to know. But the letter is not as important as how the troops took the messenger being there. The troops took this as the deal being broken and the leaders of the mutiny were going to be punished. Things go south from here. There are two different ways this story goes. First is the soldiers break into where Germanicus was staying, and at the point of a sword, forced him to give up the legion standard, and then ran off. The second is Germanicus, his wife and future son, Emperor Caligula, were being held by the soldiers. Caligula may have been kept hostage, but the men let Agrippina, Germanicus's wife, go. Both versions end mostly the same. 
The soldiers ran into the envoys, and things got bad. At least one of the envoys ran off and hid in a locked room, where the legion's eagle and other standards were kept. The man who was hiding was Montuitus Placus, a ex-consul. Now, to us modern people, this would be a big deal, but not one that had religious connotations to it. For the Romans, the harming of an envoy had religious significance. The next day, when things calmed down, Germanicus addressed the troops, with Placus with him. Germanicus explained why Placus was there and chastised the soldiers for their actions, and on being more pious. Then Germanicus sent the envoys away, with auxiliary cavalry, as escort, which is a non-Roman military unit. This was something not done. Envoys should have been escorted by Romans. This was intentionally done, almost certainly to shame the soldiers for their actions and to make sure something worse did not happen. Now Germanicus came under fire for his actions back in Rome. Some thought he should have used the legions that had not yet mutinied in Germania Superior to crush the mutiny. Then, interesting complaints were laid against Germanicus. These were him bringing his wife and kids with him. Clearly, he had put his family in danger. But when Agrippina was told this, she said she was the granddaughter of Augustus and could face any danger. I mentioned it before, but Agrippina does stand out in the sources that we have and would be a great character in this show. Eventually, because of everything that had happened, Agrippina was convinced to be sent away with the children. This had an interesting effect on the soldiers. Agrippina was being sent out of a Roman camp to go live in barbarian land. This had a powerful effect on the soldiers. It was a realization that their commander's wife was safer with foreigners. This is the point where things turn around for Germanicus. He is able to use this event to turn things to his advantage. Germanicus addressed the men and once again told them of past victories and said they should direct their anger at the enemy. This worked and the leaders of the mutiny were brought forward, tried, and killed. In a strange form of justice where the man who was guilty was put on a platform with the military tribune. If the man acknowledged his guilt and the soldiers below with their weapons drawn agreed, the man was thrown down and stabbed to death by the soldiers. Germanicus set out to fix some of the issues that caused the mutiny in the first place. Germanicus got rid of some of the officers that had caused abuse to the soldiers. Now we get to Germanicus handling a situation poorly. Germanicus sent a message to the camp of either the 5th or 21st legions. These were men who were still upset. This message was to execute anyone who showed disloyalty. This order was taken to a level Germanicus did not originally intend. It was not just men who were spreading discontent, some loyal men were killed as well. Now we know Germanicus did not intend for this level of bloodshed, because when Germanicus arrived at this camp, he was appalled at what he saw. This is Germanicus' fault, even though he did not intend for this to happen. It was Germanicus' orders that were interpreted poorly and caused this tragedy. This brings the mutiny to an end. This is the first event the show needs to have in order to appropriately show Germanicus. Many stories have an important character go through tough events, but it's all about overcoming. This is that event. It shows Germanicus' leadership ability, and he also has some close calls. Germanicus is almost killed by the men he is supposed to lead. As well, from a meta perspective, this is not a battle, and I would think it would be easier and cheaper to film. Now, with the legions back under his control, and the anger of the soldiers has been redirected, this is where the action begins. This is where the Empire strikes back. I'm not going to go over every detail of Germanicus's campaigns into Germany. I do want to still give an idea of what is going on, though. With Augustus having become a god recently, by the way, when Roman emperors died, they were deified, the Empire was in transition with getting a new leader. There was also a time of mourning for Augustus. Because of this, the Germans were not expecting any Roman attacks. What could not have been predicted is Germanicus' troops wanting to prove themselves and put the mutiny behind them. The first action was the Romans surprising the Marci tribe during a feast where many had been drinking. Let's just say this is a one-sided affair. The Marci were put to the sword, and while this does not go down as a great military victory, it was important to get the legions back in fighting shape. On their way back to Roman territory, the Germans harassed the Roman army, and Germanicus showed bravery, riding to the troops in the most danger. This gave the men more confidence, and the Romans made it back to Roman territory in good condition. Germanicus will attack the next year, and is successful against the Germans. I'll mention a few events from this campaign. During this campaign, Segestes, who has been stuck with Arminius' faction, and because of this, his life was in danger. Germanicus had Segestes rescued, and Thesnelda was also captured. Thesnelda was also pregnant with Arminius' child. This was a pretty big win for Germanicus. Another one of these wins is in Bructari lands. 
the eagle of the 19th legion was found. This eagle was lost with Varus's army. Soon after, Germanicus and the army go straight to where the Battle of Tudorberg happened. When there, survivors from the battle showed people around and told them what happened. Germanicus also had the bones of the Romans that were all around buried. This was a kind of political and religious affair, and it's pretty interesting. I should also point out that Germanicus performed some of the religious rites himself. Tiberius got upset with Germanicus because he was a member of a priestly order. Germanicus was supposed to keep his hands clean. I'm guessing touching the dead counts as uncleaning one's hands. As well, Tiberius was upset that all this time could have been better used to campaign. The next event I would like to see is the Battle of the Long Bridges. So Germanicus is not in this battle, but Arminius is involved. After the campaigning for this year, Germanicus' army was far into Germany and needed to get back to Roman territory. Germanicus had part of the army leave by boats and the other part by land. The army that is going over land gets trapped in a swamp trying to get back to Roman territory. The Romans are being led by a man called Caecina, and the Germans are being led by Arminius. The path to get back to Roman territory is a highway that goes through a swamp. This highway was built over a decade ago and parts need to be repaired. The Romans are sending engineers to fix the highway, and the other legionaries are trying to defend them. The Germans are all around the Romans, harassing them. As well, the Germans end up flooding the swamp to make it more swampy. This made the highway more impassable, making the Romans work harder to keep moving. Caecina, the Roman general, understood the Romans had to get out of there. There was part of this highway that was clear, and the Romans were going to try and escape. The Romans were going to move in a defensive way, keeping some legionaries to guard the escape route. This escape goes poorly, and some carts get stuck. Must go faster. This causes the discipline of the legionaries to break down. This is what Arminius was waiting for. This is when the Germans attack. The Germans went after the Roman eagles, knowing the impact losing them would have on the Romans. The first legion comes to the rescue and gets the rest of the army out of its bad situation. The Germans now go loot the abandoned Roman baggage. The Romans flee to less swampy ground. The Romans set up their camp but don't have the tents or tools to make a normal Roman camp because those were in the Roman baggage. This night, the Romans are on edge. During the night, a horse gets free and runs through the camp. This spooks the soldiers and they start to panic and flee, thinking the Germans are attacking. Abandon your post! Please save my life! Kaikina runs out ahead of the soldiers and convinces them that the Germans are not attacking, calming them down. Kaikina got his officers together and said they needed to fight, not run. Prepare for battle! The Germans needed to be beaten before being able to get out of this bad situation. The next day, Arminius attacked the Roman camp. The Germans went to fill in the defensive ditch around the Roman camp. The Germans then joined battle with the Romans. What the Germans did not know is the Romans were waiting for them. The Roman strategy was for the Germans to attack and fight them on firm ground that was to the Romans' advantage. When the Germans got to the top of the defensive works, the Romans attacked at the sound of trumpets. This battle was a victory for the Romans. News had spread that this army was trapped, and some people wanted to destroy the Rhine Bridge in case the Germans had won. People thought the Germans would attack into Roman territory. Agrippina, the wife of Germanicus, stopped the bridge's destruction and is waiting for the legions to arrive with food and clothing. This is another reason why Agrippina would absolutely need to be in this show. Agrippina gets praise for acting like a general and making a hard decision. This ends the Battle of the Long Bridges. If the events themselves are not interesting enough, I'll try to explain as to why these events should end up in the show. What makes this prime material for a TV show is its conditions. The Romans are trying to get through the swamp, having to repair the path to get through the swamp. What are you doing in my swamp? The Romans spend some time living in the swamp. We get the Romans trying to escape with the Germans all around them, making it difficult for the Romans to leave. It would put even more stress on the legionaries knowing the enemy is all around and could attack at any time. Several times throughout these events, the Romans looked like they are going to lose. We have the Romans' progress being hindered all the time. As well, there is the retreat that went poorly. When the Romans make their camp, there is panic and the Romans almost rout until the generals stopped it. I may not have made it clear, but the Germans thought they were going to win this fight. This is when the Germans decided to fight and set their own version of a trap and beat the Germans. We also get Agrippina keeping the bridge from being destroyed. 
As well, I am personally tired of various movies like Game of Thrones and Outlaw King and The King all having fighting in the mud. This might be the only time I would be fine with it happening. Mostly because an army trying to flee in a swamp is interesting. More interesting than just a pitched battle that turns into a mud wrestling match. This is also one of the more unique battles I have ever read about. Again, to get a bit meta with this battle, it's not some generic open field battle and could be done on a smaller scale. Focusing on individual people like Kaikina, the Roman general, and Arminius. Also, you would not necessarily have to show large amounts of people in formations across a battlefield. Just focusing on certain Roman units would work as well. A example being the Roman engineers pulling their hair out trying to build in the swamp. I have not mentioned it yet, but I don't like how Hollywood in general does field battles. Hollywood likes to just take about a football field in size and just have people in what looks like some kind of mosh pit fighting everywhere in this field. There are no battle lines or formations. The discipline that the Romans had that gives them such an advantage can't be shown in a Hollywood style scene. If I had to give an example of a good time this has been done, it's in HBO's Rome. There is a scene where some Romans take on the Gauls and fight in formation, and the director had some restraint only having one barbarian jump into the Roman lines. I mention this because this is something Hollywood loves to do. Having one or a few guys just jump onto swords or spears because it looks cool to someone in Hollywood. The last few years, things have gotten a lot better. I sort of disparagingly mentioned Outlaw King. I actually don't think that movie is that bad. It's an improvement, but things still could be better. Again, I will quickly go over a bunch of events to help people understand the event that I really want to talk about. So this is the first naval disaster, and there are two of them throughout Germanicus's campaigns. I talked about how Germanicus took part of his army by boat back to Roman territory. This is only sort of a naval disaster. Germanicus sent these men into an area that floods. The Romans were carrying their heavy equipment, and this caused some to drown. The survivors spent the night on higher ground without food because all that got lost in the water. The next day, Germanicus's ships arrived and picked up the men. Again, it's not really a naval disaster, but there are boats involved, so I'm counting it. This ends the campaigning season for the Romans. The Romans found out as much damage as they had dished out, they took plenty themselves. The losses were not only in human life, but also the material losses were bad. Many people from surrounding provinces gave money or what materials could be donated, like horses or food. Something that you notice reading through a lot of classical or ancient history is how brutal every side is in war. It's not that modern people won't do these acts, but normally they are condemned, but in the past they were pretty commonplace. This makes the past very hard to understand at times, but it's always interesting when you read something that those of us living in 2022 can understand. What I'm talking about is Germanicus going around visiting wounded soldiers and raising their spirits. This is something modern people would do. It often seems like people think others in the past were just completely cold monsters. Alright, I'll leave my tangent there. Germanicus had a problem to solve over the winter, which was the supply in Germany for his campaigns. The idea to deal with this was to do a naval invasion. This would alleviate having to walk everything into Germany, making the supply worse. Germanicus needed a large navy to accomplish this, and potentially a thousand ships were needed for the task. There are several battles before the last, more famous battle. I'll quickly go over these two battles. One being the Battle of the Weser River, where we have the Romans, led by Germanicus, and the Germans, led by Arminius. The basics of this battle is the Romans and Germans are facing each other down on each side of the Weser River. Before the battle happened, an interesting event took place. Arminius asked to see his brother, Flavius, who was still with the Romans. Flavius was loyal to Rome and had lost an eye a few years earlier when Tiberius was in command. We are told Flavius and Arminius argued. Flavius talking about Rome's strength and how Thisnelda and her son with Arminius was treated with respect. Arminius talked of Germany, their home, liberty, and the German gods. Flavius got so upset he asked for his weapons and at this point the talk ended. Germanicus was the one to go on the offensive the next day. Germanicus had the Roman cavalry cross the river. Some of the cavalry were on the wings to be a distraction, so a elite Batavian cavalry unit could charge at the German center. Arminius, expecting this, laid a trap. When the Batavians charged, they became surrounded and many were cut down. The two cavalry wings that were meant to be a distraction came to help out. Some of the Batavians were able to escape. Next is the Battle of Itztaviso. Tacitus does not really give great detail about this battle. What we know is the Romans set up for battle and were charged by the Cherusci, a German tribe. 
There were supposedly flying eagles above the battlefield. Germanicus used this to inspire the troops, the eagle being the bird on the Roman standards. Germanicus ordered a charge, and the Germans start to become disordered and get cut to pieces. Arminius almost gets killed by the Romans in this battle, but manages to escape. After this, the Romans take the armor, weapons, and supposedly heavy chains that Arminius had brought to the battle, thinking he would win and would take many Romans as slaves. These chains, used along with the weapons and armor, make a monument to the victory. This is the second monument like this Germanicus has made in Germany. Now finally I get to the third event I want to talk about, which is the Battle of the Angriven Wall. The Germans were angered by the building of the monument and decided to fight again. This was most likely going to be the Germans' last chance at getting a victory. The German leadership met and came up with a plan. This was to try and use the terrain to their advantage. What was planned was to use a bit of land between the Vesa River with marshy ground around the river, then build a earthworks defensive fortifications until the forest. The plan was for the Romans to attack the wall, and because of the defensiveness here, the Romans would not be able to break through, allowing for the Germans to flank behind the Romans fighting for the wall. I should note, because of the marsh and the forest were acting like a funnel, the Romans would have to attack the fortifications. What the Germans did not know was that the Roman scouts were watching, and Germanicus was making a plan of his own. Germanicus predicted the German flank from the forest and made his plan accordingly. How this battle went down is the Romans advanced to the German fortifications, and things don't start off well for them. The Romans, while trying to attack the defenses, get missiles thrown down at them, like javelins. Germanicus stopped the attack and brought up slingers and some artillery and started pounding the German defenses to try and take out as many of the defenders as possible. Germanicus has the legions then re-engage. Germanicus then leads the Praetorian cohorts to attack into the forest. This foils Arminius' flanking plan. Germanicus supposedly fought and killed several German warriors in single combat, taking after his father. This is where the battle starts to turn into a grind. Both sides can't get a decisive advantage. But the Romans start to slowly win, taking so long that Germanicus sends one legion to go build the camp for the night. With Arminius being wounded, he and the other German leadership ran away, and the Germans broke. This is a Roman victory, but Arminius has gotten away again. After this, battle is the long trek back to Roman territory. Along the way, the second and worse naval disaster happens, with many men being lost. The storm that caused the disaster sent men off into German territory, and these men were either captured or killed. It's really a mess, but eventually what is left of the scattered ships and men regroup. Germanicus beats a few more German tribes, recovering a lost eagle when that tribe surrenders. To wrap up this section, the Battle of the Angriven Wall should be the big battle for the show. Arminius lays a trap, and it does not work out because the Romans knew about it. It could be interesting to see this battle mainly from the point of view of the Germans, thinking the trap will work. But then, the Praetorian cohorts, led by Germanicus, charge into the troops that are supposed to win the Germans the battle. The German plan well, does not go to plan, and they eventually lose. That would be an interesting way to frame this battle. I think this being the last battle between Arminius and Germanicus, in and of itself, has its importance. The battle is not a one-sided affair, and that makes it more suspenseful. Great for TV. Now, unfortunately, what makes this bit of history difficult for TV is the end for these Germanic wars. It's not decisive. To be honest, the war does not really end, but the Roman tactics change, and it goes from an aggressive conquest to more of a multi-pronged strategy. This is to use diplomacy, money, and other ways, by the way, these still could be violent, to keep the German tribes from threatening Rome. Tiberius makes Germanicus stop after this campaigning season. Tiberius' reasons are the losses have been great. Germanicus wants to continue, thinking only a bit more time and he could finally subdue the Germans. Soon after, Germanicus is reinstated to the east, to Syria, on the Parthian border, where Germanicus will eventually be assassinated. Who he is assassinated by is up to debate and really a story for another time. Arminius's end is slowly losing support from the other German tribes and also gets killed. This is what would make ending this show difficult. No big decisive end. The Romans have a clear advantage, but the Germans still have some fight in them. If you look later down the historical timeline, the Germans will be a huge problem. As well, if Germanicus is not established well, this end would be difficult because he ends up in a better situation. Germanicus is hailed a hero in Rome. I'll point this out, that Germanicus gets to have a triumph. This is one of the most prestigious honors a Roman can attain. To end this video, this period of history is very interesting and could be very good for historical dramatization. 
There is a lot to work with here, and the events themselves would be good to see on the big screen. Potentially a story where everyone wants to get revenge and has reason to get revenge would make for a great story.